Rebuilding a tangy model steam engine part 5, removing the old land packings and making a new crank pin. As you've just seen in the introduction section, I started off by using a spanner and I thought, well, hang on a minute, this will be easier. And yes, it was. The gland nut came out straight away with the socket. After removing the gland nut, it's time to look in the hole to see what I find and I find some very horrible gland packing. It's long past its best and it's just fragmenting as I remove it with the point of a scalpel. I found more of the same thing in the valve chest gland, so I removed that as well. This is the crank web disc, and as you can see, it's in a bit of a state. At first I thought it just looked very rusty. On closer inspection, I realised that the crank web is made from brass. So I don't know how it managed to get to be that colour, because it just looks like rust. Anyway, that's not a problem, that would clean off. The crank pin itself is made from steel, and indeed that is very rusty. Here it is in my hand. I'm really not sure of the size of the thread on the crank pin. As far as I'm aware, these engines were originally of German origin, so I'm presuming the thread on the crank pin is possibly coarse metric. The crankshaft is OK, I think. I'll find out shortly. So what to do about this hole in the crank web? It's not something I can process, so I'm going to rethread it. But before that, I'm going to clean up the crank web disc, and when I put it in the chuck, it looks like the crankshaft's bent. Although when I first got this engine and spun the flywheel, everything seemed to be running true. I don't really understand this. It's not running very true at the moment, but it doesn't need to because I'm only using emery cloth. I'm going to push the crankshaft further into the chuck and see if that spins true. And yes, it does. That's good. The question is, what do I do about this? Do I make a complete new one-piece crankshaft, which I can turn from the solid? I'll live with it as it is. I'll think about this as the short series continues. In this clip you can clearly see that the further the crank web gets from the chuck, the more it wobbles. It's really difficult knowing what to do. If I make a new crankshaft, it will have to be oversized, because the bearings are a bit worn. With this particular engine, I'm not going to get bogged down with technicalities. It is, after all, a very old brass engine, and brass is a very unsuitable material for making steam engines from. It's fine for the tiny little oscillating cylinder things, but when you get to a certain size, it's not so good. It doesn't wear well. If the parts were made from gun metal, it would have been much better. In this clip, I'm re-threading the crank web, and I'm doing it manually with a second tap. That's a tap with a bit of a taper on it, but not too much of a taper. It's very important to make sure that the thread is exactly square to the crank web. When I try a 2BA bolt in place, it fits perfectly, it's nice and tight. So now I need to make one of these, but before I do that I need to find out what its diameter is. The micrometer tells me that it's 20 thou under a quarter of an inch, so I thought I'd try some metric drills just in case 20 thou under a quarter of an inch was a metric size. It wasn't M5 or M6, so I'm going to make it out of a piece of quarter of an inch diameter stainless steel. And what am I doing at the moment? I'm using a magnet to just verify that this is actually stainless steel, because it isn't magnetic. It's into the chuck with the quarter of an inch diameter piece of stainless steel, and I'm about to turn down one end of it and thread it to 2BA. And to turn down the end of this piece of stainless steel, I'm using a parting tool. The parting tool leaves a very good finish on the work, and at the end of the cut it's at a perfect 90 degrees. In this clip I'm comparing the length of the original crank pin because I need this to be exactly the same. I'm taking a fraction more off because I do need to round the end of this. Not strictly necessary, but it's good practice. This is the end of the crank pin that's going to take the nut and washer that will hold the connecting rod in place. I'm going to have to make one of those, and I'm going to have to make a cross head, a piston rod and a piston. And I almost forgot a cylinder cover too. I looked in my chart for tapping sizes for 2BA and the chart said 4.1 millimetres, well I don't have one of those. I don't need to use a drill, I just wanted to know what the diameter of this shaft at this point needs to be for threading it 2BA. In the end I set my micrometer using a 964 of an inch twist drill and this should be a good size to thread 2BA. The last thing that I want is an undersized thread on the end of this shaft. I think it's time to check it with the micrometer. Still a little bit on the large side, but after another pass, that was it. It was down to the size I wanted. Jobs like this are not difficult at all, and the more you do them, the more routine they become. 
The end of the shaft is just the size I need it to be. I'm putting some oil on the end of it and then bringing a tailstock die holder into place. Except it's not a tailstock die holder. I have a special die holder system that I showed in a video a while back. It's a simple adapter that fits on a die holder shank in the tailstock and the adapter then fits into a commercial die holder. These are very cheap, I bought them from Black Hits Engineering. On top of my phase converter at the side of the lathe I have a long piece of wood with holes drilled in it which holds lots of these die holders fully loaded. One of the problems when cutting threads on shafts like this is that the die will not cut the thread all the way up to the shoulder of the piece of bar. As you can see there's always a plain bit at the end. But once you've cut the thread if you turn the die over and go in from the other end it will cut a little bit further. And that's because on the front part of the die there's a slight taper to help it engage with the work. It's still not 100% up to the shoulder of the shaft but it's near enough for rock and roll. In this clip I'm just rounding the end very slightly using some 100 grit emery cloth. Time now to do a comparison between the original part and the one I'm making. This is the end that's going to take the nut to hold the connecting rod in place. So now I need to part off this piece of bar so I can thread the other end. This stainless steel cuts very well but some stainless steels do not and it's very important to keep a constant pressure on the cutting tool so that the tool doesn't rub on the work and get hot. If that happens the stainless steel work hardens and then the tool blunts and you can't cut it. I'm not going to show the threading process again because you've already seen it. This is the other side, I haven't reversed the die on this one for a particular reason. In this clip I'm drilling down into the crank web a very small amount and it's most important that this hole that I'm drilling is very accurate. And that's why I'm using a V-block in the machine vise in the milling machine to keep the shallow hole square with the crank web. And now it's time to apply some Loctite substitute, this stuff's called Bond Lock. Here I'm screwing the crank pin firmly into place. I've used a nut and a washer on the other end, which allowed me to tighten it into the hole fully. Here's a comparison between the old crank pin at the bottom and the new one fitted into the crank web, ready to receive the connecting rod that I'll be making shortly. And here's the job so far. That's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.